Uh, big round of applause for Erica Plunkett from AMA International. Thank you for uh, Thank you. joining me today. Um, it was just, uh, it was uh, not even a month into being in Grand Rapids when I reached out to you and we sat down for a quick coffee um, and uh, started talking about uh, your journey as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and how that led you um, a lot of different ways. Yeah. Now, um, these are always really great to start with uh, the basics. Like who are you and uh, your maybe your origination story? So I am, oh geez, that's a big question. Um, I got started. Um, by serving local at-risk teens in the Grand Rapids area through my church. My husband and I were mentors for about 12, 13 years. Um, and those experiences with kids who are high risk, dealing with issues like parents have abandoned them or drugs in the home or drug addicts for parents or dealing with drugs themselves, all of these things, um, and me being in a role where we were creating programs for them, to maybe go to camps or retreats or have very like self-centered experiences. And so I began to think of what would happen if we created an other-centered experience. So put them in an environment where they're, they're meeting, um, they're seeing things like in And so that idea is what got me started on the journey to helping another nation. And so going there the very first time with 56 Americans, most of them being um, college age or high school age, and just seeing how it literally changed their worldview, and they came back, and then there was like a culture shift within their own life. Um, the power of that on, on our end, the things that we can gain by exposing ourselves and our children to a different lifestyle. Um, and then going there and then seeing something that you can't unsee. Um, so seeing children in so much need and knowing that we have so much more than we need here. Um, how can I be a part of a solution? How can I build a bridge to help? Um, so that's kind of what got me started. That's kind of my journey um, in a nutshell. <laughs> Now, Ed, did you have examples from childhood on uh, this entrepreneurial like journey? Yeah, I mean, when I was really young, I've always, um, I've always been an advocate. There's always been something I was, it was like recycle or like I was. There was always something I was like making posters and um, I like to write. So I was like on the newspaper at school and I would like write about whatever, you know. So I've always had this spirit of like I want to change the world, right? So. Um, but then you, you grow up and you get older and you realize that you may not be able to change the world, but you can change the world for someone. Um, so it kind of flips, but then you realize that is changing the world. Um, so that's the cool part of it. Um, but yeah, when I was younger, like my parents have been pastoring here in Grand Rapids for 25 years. So there'd be different missionaries that would come through. And I always would be so interested in you know, how do other people live and what are their stories? And then I worked at Women at Risk International for a number of years and just got exposed to all kinds of culture. And that's a human trafficking organization. Um, and so just just absorbed a lot, learned a lot, and just, I don't know, that's kind of how all of the pieces kind of fit together that got me on this journey of helping another country. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and AMA is your full-time job? No. So I have a consultant business that I do. Um, so Alma right now is a passion project, kind of to what you said, when do I start paying myself? <laughs> um, so it's one of those things where right now it's passion and it's, you know, volunteering and it's, there's a team that we're working together. Um, but I do a consulting um, job. It's my own business and I have a few different clients for that. And I work with a lot of nonprofits with consulting and um, support and so it's still very fulfilling. So that's kind of how I help support the family. But yeah, this is definitely takes a lot of my time, but I, I love it. So, so yeah, having this uh, you know on the side, even though it probably doesn't really equate to that, right? In hours, um, and then uh, and having gone through all of that journey to get to to Ama and doing what you're doing, um, what has it been like to to build this uh, this team around you? Because you've been doing it for many years, right? And uh, so how did you start to cobble together this team to follow you? Yeah. So I think what really helped was um, getting people that came with me. 
um, to where we're working. So that really opens up a lot of um, understanding when you're able to see physically like what the work is that we're doing, who are the children that we're you know reaching out to, where do they live, how do they live. Um, so I think those experiences are important. And then just knowing that I am not good at everything, you know, that I need people that are good at other things like math <laughs> that I'm not that good at. And it's like, I need people to come and help um, in different areas. And then realizing that actually people really do like to help others. And so they want to use their, their skills for good. And so you give an opportunity for that. And it's amazing how people will dedicate time to, um, to help. So just through conversations, through sharing my heart through tears, through long car rides, bus rides, planes, trains, and automobiles, you know, um, just connecting with people is kind of how um, I built the team and still growing. Um, but, you know, people will, they'll hear about it, they'll want to know more, and then they'll say, well, how can I help? And it's the wrong thing to say to me because I'm going to give you something to do. So um, that's usually how I'm like, okay, you said you wanted to help, right? Okay, this is, what are you good at? Okay, let me find something. Okay, here you go. And then it just starts, you know, and next thing they know, they're, and I want everyone to be a part of AMA because what we like to say about AMA is AMA is a living organism that thinks, feels, and connects, that we have a beating heart. It is a it, it is, it's beyond just an organization. It's a living thing, and we're all a part of it. So when we connect and we're all a part of it, it's just it's this organism that works together. So I want everyone to be a part of it. I think that's an invitation. Yes, it is. <laughs> so um, now it sounds like from somebody from the outside, you know, like this is kind of sounds like it's uh, grown a bit organically, as has the team. But um, what you're doing has a lot of moving parts. It seems like the logistics um, might drive me crazy. Can you speak to the, some of these elements that, and these balls that you're juggling? Yeah, and so it's definitely, there's a lot of logistics. And thankfully, I have got really strong partners in Mexico that help with logistics on that end because I, I would have no idea what I was doing if I didn't have that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot that I'm still juggling and trying to figure out. And so, and I think that's, it doesn't matter if it's a nonprofit or whatever you're doing entrepreneur wise, um, you have to learn how to delegate. Um, and that's hard for me because I like to just be in control of everything. Um, but learning how to delegate and taking some of these challenges and understanding that not everybody's going on the journey with you. And sometimes people will, um, want to help, but then they'll kind of get into it and they'll just be like, eh, I'm not feeling it. And you have to be willing to not let that hurt your feelings and know that someone else will come along and they'll want to give it their all. Um, so it's, if there's a lot of things that I, I can't hand, like I can't do it all. So I've had to accept that, you know, there's like email marketing in the beginning. I was like, yes, once a month. And I like got like, two months out and I'm like, yeah, I don't have time for that. So, um, you know, as you grow, you have to like have expectations, but then know that if I don't meet it, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to keep plugging along. I'm going to keep doing whatever I can. And then when I, when I have opportunities to delegate, do that. Um, that way you can take some pressure off and focus on other things. Mm -hmm. So, um, when you get down there mm -hmm. and when it's go time, what is, what does a day look like? So we usually get up pretty early. Um, we'll have breakfast. And then when we have like our community days, um, the medical team usually heads out first, starts to set up. We usually have tents set up, tables, chairs. We have pop-up clinics. So we have medical clinics, dental clinics, um, haircut stations, a lot of free resources for the community. So drawing people in, building trust. We're all wearing our AMA shirts. Um, everyone is very welcoming, loving. We've got like probably close to 200 volunteers in Mexico that work with us. So we've got like this partnership. So we're bringing close to 100 people and they're bringing, you know, so we've got a big team of volunteers. And so then we start offering the services we get and we're getting better and better at it. Um, building the strategy of how to get people in and out, how to keep everything flowing. And Carolyn serves on our medical team. Wave your hand, Carolyn. And so she's been, a, she's been there and she's getting ready to go with us again. And so you just, it's amazing. You see like 
everybody's doing their job and everybody's working. We've got clowns that are painting faces, singing songs with children. And the whole point is to capture people and to get their information so then you can start to walk a journey with them. Because it goes back to what I said in the beginning, like when you walk a journey with someone, and my husband and I have seen this through our mentorship, is like these some of the kids that we mentored are now like our really good friends and they're like a part of our team and like I can't imagine not having them a part of our team but they needed someone to start walking that journey with them um, and so that's why it's so important to build relationships so that's where you start you offer something you create an environment that's fun exciting welcoming I'm going to serve you I care about you and you start to build trust and it doesn't even matter that you don't speak the same language it's amazing because there's this mutual love that happens and you can sense it when someone's real and genuine and when they're not and so if you present yourself as real it's just phenomenal what happens the interactions that happen and then you're able to connect with the person and say how can we help you how can we serve you in your journey and so we've seen a lot of retention with that that plan of having a big community um, event and then getting people's information and being able to connect and uh and we spoke about this when we last uh we met even though i think it's going to be helpful to throw a number out there so like the like what are the how many people are we affecting like when you go down there like currently so to date um, we estimate 8,000 people that we've served um, on our last trip that we went that we did which was in southern Mexico we served 1,004 people with medical care treating over 3,500 different medical conditions, um, about 114 people with dental conditions, and there were about 500 kids a day that we served. Um, so it's it varies, um, but I don't like I tend to stay away from numbers because, like, I had a conversation with someone a couple weeks ago where they're like, "Yeah, 8,000 people. I've been on mission trips where we serve that many people in a day." And so I'm like, yeah, that's amazing. But like our strategy is very qualitative. We want to build relationships and you get over a certain number and it becomes impossible. There just aren't enough volunteers and it just becomes a sea of people and it, it, it's helpful, but it's not lasting. It's not like creating a bond with people because you can't, you know, you can't connect when there's just this volume of people that's just beyond, you know? So I was like, yeah, but that's a different approach. Like, I respect that approach, but ours is just different, you know? And so it's interesting. So I I like to share numbers because people like numbers, especially Americans. And so I know I have to share them, but I tend to say, like, I want to give you the experiences. Like, I want you to see the children's faces that light up and, and, like, how now they know me by name and they run up and give me a hug. And, like, that's what I want to translate is are the relationships versus the numbers. And uh, and this approach um, is uh, has, is it's fairly unique in what you're doing. It seems like because now there are people asking you for help in like fulfilling their vision, mm -hmm. right? So, can you tell us about like another just another thing you've gotten that you said yes to? <laughs> this is the TJ. Which one? Yeah, this is uh, the uh, Tijuana. So um, now we have, we have, it's so cool because just this week we had some doctors join us there from California. I met them uh, a year ago um, when I was in Santa Monica and um, they're related to some of the people we work with in Mexico and they just joined our medical team. And so we're just so excited. But there's a group in California that they seen what we were doing and they were like, will you come basically like consult with us and help us do this like we'll do it we'll raise the money we'll we'll do the work but we just don't know how to do it so will you come like do it with us and show us how to be effective and show us your strategy and stuff so we're like of course so now we're working on that and then even Corey has a friend that he's connected me to that has been doing work with some of the um, displaced um, individuals that are in Tijuana um, so we want to just connect all of those dots and just try to do be very effective in at the border um, so it's really cool that someone noticed and said, hey, teach us, you know, how, how to do this. And so, yeah, that's the, the power of asking and then, of course, saying yes. Mm -hmm. And then we also uh, heard you speak a little bit about um, the importance of really understanding what it is that you're doing and when to say no. Yes. Um, can you uh, let us know maybe an, another example or two of where you had to mm -hmm. go counter and say, yes. you know what, no. Yeah, and that's hard to do, especially when there's money involved, when someone has like a check for you. But 
they have a totally different vision. And so sometimes it's really hard to, to be able to just say, that's not our value structure. That's not how we operate. So you, it's amazing what will happen if you just have a candid conversation, though, and you can say, you know, we really don't function like that. And so maybe we can't. <laughs> So maybe we can't work together, but but then you can sometimes compromise, which is great. You know, that's what the goal is. You know, I'm not saying our way is the only way or the best way, but we've decided that our this is our method. This is how we feel comfortable. So sometimes if someone says, well, we really need this, and, and a lot of it usually has to do with numbers, is we really need to have, you know, this many people present, this ma you know, to be able to say that it's been successful. And so being able to say, I can't promise that, and I'm not going to promise that because that's not even my goal um, or our goal as an organization. So that it does get hard to say. It's definitely hard to say no, especially if someone's like, well, we'll fund this or we'll do this or that, um, and we'll, we'll do all these things, but you're going to have to do it our way. And then you just have to make a decision. And so it's not always easy, but... You sleep a lot better at night knowing that you stayed true to your values and what you, you sleep know. at night. <laughs> no, <laughs> not very <Okay>. much. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, a lot of times we're, we we want to turn those no's into yeses, and that's like good good mm -hmm. negotiating, right? Yeah. And I've never heard anyone speak to negotiating like you did. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about your style? Uh huh. Yes. Yeah, so I feel I've I'm a mom. I have a 13, 14 year old girls. And I feel like I learned so much when they were young. And so I feel like I learned a lot of negotiating skills for my kids. Kids are such good negotiators. Like they're like, mom, 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 mom. Like they don't care that I'm ignoring them. They're going to keep saying it until, first of all, I give them the attention. So that's one. So I'm going to knock on a door until the person says, stop knocking on my door. And even when, like, when I would say, yes, w what do you need? I want to have a sleepover. Okay. Let me think about it. No, mom, listen, I'm going to clean the house. I'm going to do this and that. And I'm like, okay, well, if you clean the house and you do the laundry, it like, it becomes this whole negotiating thing. All these different things are on the table. Like who's going to do what? And in the end, I end up saying, okay, fine. If you do all of these things and you guys promise to go to bed before 2 AM, you know, or whatever. Um, but you, you can learn a lot from having like that childlike faith that just says it, it's not going to, hurt my, my feelings if you tell me no. I'm just going to try another angle. Or if you're like, I don't know, I'm just going to push a little harder. And like, they just aren't rattled like we are as adults. They're just so, it's so easy for them to just say. So I have a, um, a godson who's, how old is Judah? Like two and a half. So by the time he was like, I don't know, old enough to say words, like we would hand him a cookie and he'd say two. And then you'd give him two, he'd be like three. <laughs> like he's like they're already there and I just so I observe these things with kids and I love children and I studied early childhood development in college and so like I love how kids brains work and I just think that we can learn so much from them and how like sometimes we get so like offended in our feelings like oh they don't like me they don't want you know my organization isn't good enough but maybe it's just you have to present it in a different way so try another way you know and so usually I'll just keep emailing someone until they say, stop emailing me. And I haven't had that happen yet. So <laughs> usually if they don't respond, I'm just like, hey, just circling back, you know. And um, I'll just keep knocking on that door until it's, it's for sure closed. And I feel like I learned that from my kids. That's awesome. I think this is a great lesson, uh, especially as, as founders, entrepreneurs, we're just crushed by the word no. Yes. We put our hearts mm -hmm. in this stuff. Um, so uh, I think you spoke a lot about uh, your background, how everything came to be, and it continues to move on. It, se it seems like you're a very resilient individual. Um, is there a difference to you between resiliency and grit? Hmm. 
Yes, I think there is a difference because resiliency has to do with kind of how you bounce back, but grit has to do with like, are you willing to get in the weeds? Are you willing to get your hands dirty? Um, I was just sharing with someone <laughs> that there's two different kinds of people who go on these trips. Some people, they're like, yeah, I just want pictures playing with children and, you know, I'll sit in a school and I'll, you know, do some puzzles. <laughs> and then there's people who are like, no, I want to be sweating. I want to be dirty. I want to clean. And there was one for, for instance, there was one place that we went the last trip where we, we were going to have this big event, but we had to clean the space first, right? Because there's nobody that's going to do it for us. That's what we're there to do. So, But people were so extra. They were like, oh, my gosh. Even though they had gloves, they were like, I can't touch that. And, like, it was just so funny. And I'm just, like, picking stuff up. and Because I just feel like as a leader, if I can't get my hands dirty, how can I expect anyone else? Plus, I like that work. Like, I like to feel like I'm contributing, like I'm, I'm doing it. And so I think that's the difference is the grit is saying, I will get in the weeds, I will do the dirty job. And the resiliency is saying, it's not going to hurt my feelings if, you know, someone doesn't want to participate or whatever. But I still pushed everybody to do it. And it was, it was gross. It was very gross. And everybody went straight to the showers afterwards. <laughs> um, but I just think those kind of experiences, because as Americans, we're so used to like people cleaning up after us, we don't even we don't even realize it, and we're so used to like everything already being done when we arrive somewhere. Um, but when you're putting on, when you're doing it all, like you have to do all of it. So um, it's it's fun. I love just messing these American people up when they go, and they're just the experiences that they have, and they're just like blown away. But it's so beautiful. So. Yeah, I think that's the difference between. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it does. Okay. Um, and uh, and then you also answered like what happens when when people say no, and you're like, nope, you're you're getting in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got elbows. I want to see them dirty. Yes. Yeah, I dig it. Um, so then uh, in in the title of the talk, we also have you know uh, approaching adversity with creativity. So clearly, you're working across borders. You have a team over there. You have a team over here. This isn't your full time gig. Um, you might have hit a roadblock or two. Uh, I think we might want to hear about some of the more uh, dire situations. <laughs> we love, love it when it gets dirty. Yeah, it's, well, a lot of, of course, my biggest challenge is always going to be fundraising, right? And that has been, I think, my biggest roadblock is getting people um, here to want to invest overseas, but particularly in Mexico. Um, for some reason, well, um, for for some reason, there there's like the stigma on Mexico. And so when you start introducing what you're doing, like you'll get comments that will shock you about what people's perception is of Mexico. And then you just also just get people who are like, sorry, we just want to invest locally. And so I just got to the point where I was like, I have to try to come up with a way to change this narrative like how can I get people to think outside of that like outside of the walls of just Michigan or Kent County or whatever Grand Rapids and so I've just been saying to people that I've talked to and I have a few different people I'm kind of negotiating with right now um if you're not going to do it who who's going to invest the past 12 people I've asked have told me no that we only keep our dollars here. So who is who's going to help our neighbors? And um, we live on one continent together. You know, we share this whole land, body of land. So can we can we kind of break down those barriers a little bit? And so I'm just trying to change that narrative. And then something else that I've been saying lately is like, you know, diversify your portfolio. Like I want people to give to the big corporations that have proved themselves, like you know, that are amazing, that do awesome work. But what if you took some of those investment dollars, those philanthropic dollars, and said, I'm going to invest in some grassroots efforts. I'm going to take some of this. I'm going to invest in something overseas. I'm going to take this. I'm going to invest in kids. Like Just like you diversify your investment portfolio otherwise, do it in your philanthropic um, portfolio. And so that's definitely my biggest hurdle, I think, is just getting people to think outside of the context of, well, that's how everybody else does it here, and we just want to keep everything right here. And I'm like, I wish I could just take you to some of these places, because if you could see the things that I've seen, you would say, yeah, I, I can throw you 
some change. <laughs> so like take them, not their dollars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's why I always tell people like, I don't want your money. I want your heart because there's a difference between when you get someone who really cares, um, it's so much more than just writing me a check and saying, oh, bye, here, you know, here's $400 or whatever. Um, but if you get someone's heart, then they're going to stick with you. You know, they're going to want to, they're going to call you up and say, how's it going? Or when they see you, they're going to say, what's next? You know, how did that last project go? And I love those conversations because then they're like, oh, you know, I want to give to the next one. And that's, that's how it works. So that's definitely been my biggest hurdle, I would say. So it sounds like you've um, mastered some negotiating skills, you know, with some fun examples. And then, uh, um, and then leadership has uh, been a lifelong journey for you as far as learning the, the how-tos there. Mm -hmm. um, but I am kind of interested in hearing about maybe some leadership challenges, mm -hmm. um, whether it's more so in the organization of the, of the trips or mm -hmm. it's on the ground. Mm -hmm. some, some examples for the, for the group. Um, so definitely, I feel like in the organization, leadership, like that goes pretty well, usually um, pretty smooth. But it, yeah, I think it's more on the ground because people are tired, you know, people are out of their element. There's some culture shock going on. So I usually try to have other, like there's several of us in charge. That way everybody's not just always coming to me because that has happened before and that's real stressful. <laughs> so you have to have other people that are, you know, that face that they can go to and count on and talk to and stuff. But I think, um, yeah, you just get, you're in an environment that you're not used to. And um, Mexico time is different than U.S. time. I will say my first trip I took was to Dominican Republic. And island time is like way slower than Mexican time. So then the people who came on the Mexico, I'm like, you would never survive in, on the islands because they're way, way slower. So like that, like the, the different um, ways that we perceive time and um, even the structure of the day, like they're going to eat breakfast way later, like 11. Um, lunch is going to be like three or four. And then dinner is like at nine. And this is like kids too and everything. And so Americans, we try to accommodate some, but at the same time, you want to have that experience. So that's a challenge. Um, and then we're, we're very independent. So we're used to being able to say, okay, I'm done. Peace. I'm going to go back to the hotel. And I'm just like, nope, you're going to stay because we're all stay, sticking together. You know, this is the safest. So some of those things can be difficult um, because we have such an independent spirit, which is amazing about us. Um, but trying to fit into a different culture, I think, is, is a challenge. Um, do you have, uh, uh, any, has there been any help down there, like mentors down there to help realize that kind of difference or shift in time or experience or do you have mentors here that have helped you inform how to be a leader? Yeah. I mean, I am always trying to find mentors. I, one of my clients I consider a mentor cause he's done philanthropic world or philanthropic work all over the world. And yeah, I have a few different, I have someone who's, she's like an aunt to me that she's done work in India, Sri Lanka. And so I have a lot of sounding boards that I go to and say, you know, this is the challenge. Can you help me? Can you advise me? And I have to have that. Like, it's so important for me to be able to talk through that. And then people there as well. And, and then the people that I work with there, they have mentors and leaders as well. And we're always wanting to learn. And that's one thing that I definitely want to make sure I translate is that I don't feel like, I mean, like I'm learning so much right now and I still have so much to learn. And so I don't have all the answers for what I'm doing even, but I'm, I'm willing to learn and I'm always welcoming. Um, someone told me not too long ago, you should always have three people that you're learning from and three people that are learning from you at all times. And so I have like, okay, I need to be very intentional about that because I want to make sure that I'm investing in the next generation and have people, you know, that are, because who knows, you know, I want Ama to go on beyond me and Plus, I just want to invest, and then I need people that I can learn from and get get what I need from. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, now, I think we've gotten a lot of really great detail on um, on, on some of what Ama's doing, what it's like in a day life, a day in the life on the ground. Um, can you tell us a bit about the community 
that is down there because um, sometimes we hear, oh, yeah, I go down, I do this thing at the clinic, and there's a bunch of people, but we don't understand necessarily the size of this community that you're actually in. Yeah. Yeah. So where the Connection Center is positioned in Zapopan, Mexico, is um, there's about 300,000 people living in extreme poverty. And something that you should know about Zapopan is it's the Silicon Valley of Mexico. It is a city of 6 million people. But as is very common in Latin America, there's a huge chasm between the rich and poor. So you've got very, very impoverished communities without electricity, running water, scarcely dressed children. Um, and then you've got very, very extremely wealthy people, you know, driving really nice cars and living in really lush homes. And so you've got this extreme. Um, and then, like I said, there's all this tech there. Like there's, they're cutting edge technology everywhere and there's great industry there, but there's not access. And so one of the things that we want to do in our goal this year is to finish what we call the cyber center. So we're, we brought 10 computers to Mexico last year in September on our big trip to Mexico. And we, we want to get that whole cyber center online and get um, curriculum and begin to teach, first of all, computer literacy. So just the basics of how to use a mouse, how to use a keyboard, how to use the internet, how to draft an email, all of those things. And then we want to keep scaling up. My vision, my goal, and someone touched on it earlier, was coding. Like, because if you can equip kids with some of these skills, like, it'll start to accelerate their possibilities, especially in the in a tech environment. If, if they were in some remote village, that wouldn't be the thing to teach them. But because they're in an area where this could actually charge them forward, we want to try to teach those skills. So Grand Valley State University has partnered with us, their computer science department, and they are helping us build a virtual classroom for the students. So they, they'll be able to come in and interface with the curriculum here. We'll have one server. And it's so cool because one of the guys on the team that's helping build this, he told me two weeks ago, he said, I want to come down with you when you go down, and I'm going to get the whole classroom set up. I'm going to get the server online. I want to make sure there's no glitches. Like, And I was like, wow. So he's going to take his own money to come down there and get us online and get us rolling just out of the kindness of his heart because that's how much he cares. And that's just so cool. So, mm -hmm. That's magical. Yes, it is. <laughs> I know. Cool. It's very touching. Uh -huh. And uh, so when you're, when you're bringing these connections, uh, especially a uh, partnership like Grand Valley State University down there, what is the impression on the ground? Uh, your, your team and your partners down there, what do they, what do they feel? That, that is just something that you, the thing that we hear all the time is like, why do you care so much about us? Like, we just can't believe that you would come all the way from the United States, all Michigan. And it was so cute because one day there's the girl was like, they're from Michigan, California, <laughs> trying to figure out where we are. But they're like, you would come down here t to serve us, to work with us, to just love us. Like, they're just blown away that th this community is just blown away. And, and the, the people in the worst poverty that I've ever seen are some of the most joyful people you'll ever meet. And you're like, how is it possible that someone can have so little but have so much joy? And we have so much to learn from that. So it's such a, there's such an exchange that happens between the people there and the people here. It's, it's amazing. But yeah, their impression of us is just every time is like, wow. That's why we have so many volunteers. And that's how we ended up in southern Mexico, because we had gone there to Sopopan. And they were like, well, we want to go somewhere that needs more help than we do. So they're the ones that started that. So because of us going to serve them, they're like, we want to go serve someone in greater need. So then we went on a 20-hour bus ride to go serve people in southern Mexico to an earthquake-stricken land um, and serve there for five days because it was a forward moving circle. Like we influenced them and they wanted to go, you know, so it's just, it's amazing what happens when you serve others in a genuine way. And then they just want to do, they want to do good. They want to help someone else. Mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> I'm going to, I guess, push on that a little bit and then a nice little plug at the same time for startup grind. So, um, and then we'll do some Q and A cause uh, we're, I think we're, we were a little delayed getting started, but, uh, I mentioned at the outset that, uh, 
um, a lot of startup grinds, you know, values are like, how can I help you? You know, help others before you help yourself, etc. Um, and then maybe you could uh, talk about uh, this new opportunity through startup grind that you can have down on the ground uh, while I pull up the questions. <laughs> so it was really cool because um, you know it's it's amazing how things connect and work together and. Um, I believe that everything has purpose. And so Corey, he was talking with the person that you were working with at the Global Conference? Yeah, I had the, I had the benefit of being asked to uh, uh, MC a stage. So I was emceeing an innovation stage all day long on Tuesday, and it was such a great opportunity. Um, and uh, my stage managers happened to be the chapter director for Guadalajara. And where is yeah. Guadalajara? It's in Sapopan. It's the same place. He's like, of course, of course you're from Guadalajara. He's like, there's a girl that I need to introduce you to. So he connected me to him and I called him a few weeks ago. We had a great conversation and I'm getting him connected to my partners down there. And he already serves his community. He's been serving in some different capacities there. So, and he's, he's like, I have a whole group of people that would love to volunteer and get connected and they're already in the tech field. So it's just opening more opportunities and that's what's so cool about Startup Grind is the values are very, they're very beautiful to have an other-centered focus and not what can I get but what can I give first. And so it was really cool to see that like internationally. Like that's so neat. Um, so I was able to talk to him and get, um, get connected with him and we'll see where it goes. But yeah, who knows? I mean... I can't wait to meet some people in California too. Like it's just so cool. Right when I when I mentioned this to Martin, the chapter director down there, he just lit up. He was just so excited to get uh, plugged in and help out. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how that relationship grows. Yep. Uh, so we're gonna get into some Q and A here. Um, I figured this out. This is awesome. This uh, app Toasty is a really great uh, <laughs> opportunity to be able to manage uh, Q and A for meetings like this. And then it also has a great feature uh, where you can uh, pair people up with uh, uh, different uh, sizes of groups and uh, put them through some fun, um, uh, like networking games, like answering questions and all that fun stuff. So um, we have some fun questions here. Some good, thoughtful ones. Um, what are some of the biggest fruits of AMA? Oh, man. Um, the biggest fruits. I would say that they are definitely yet to be seen. I, they're already starting to be seen, but we're just so young. We're like crawling now, you know. Um, but for me, it's the relationships that are being built between us and the volunteers there and then the relationships that we're building with the children there that like I said that they already know some of us by name um, that there's already communication between people there and people here so I think the biggest fruits right now are the relationships which is like the foundation for everything that we're doing so that's the fruits now and then also obviously seeing children using the library that we put in seeing children reading books um, so, yeah, the education piece is definitely very fruitful. Um, here's, a, here's a good one. What does follow-up look like medically and otherwise? Mm -hmm. So follow-up, it's really great because my partner um, there is very well connected in the community. So even, like, for instance, we had a lady who she there was clearly something emergency going going on. They figured out she needed an emergency surgery. So we were able to, through his connections, get her into a hospital, which is not easy to do, and have surgery that day. So she was taking care of that day. And so follow-up would be getting all of those contacts, um, all the leaders that we work with there locally, then start to connect with the people. They'll go visit them um, and start to try to build relationships with the ones that they can. And uh, this is a, a quick one. Do you go to the same place every time? So we do go to our headquarters is in Sapopan. So this is the, we're getting ready to take our second trip there. Um, but we did also go to Oaxaca, to Santa Maria Shadani, which is southern Mexico. And then we are going to Tijuana. So we are going to do little offshoot trips, but we do want to stay focused on our headquarters because we want to see a systemic change, you know, and we want to see like, growth. So that's why we want to keep going back. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the name 
mean? What's the meaning behind the organization name? So AMA means love in Spanish. So AMA Sin Fronteras was our very first slogan that we made, which means love without borders. Um, so, yeah, that's what AMA means is love. And uh, do you provide interpre interpreting during medical care? Interpreting, like language interpretation? Yeah, so we always have interpreters. And so it was interesting when we were in Oaxaca, we had an indigenous language. So we had people speaking an indigenous language, and then they would translate to Spanish, and then from Spanish to English if we were trying to, you know, go that. So that was fun. That was cool. So I learned a, f a few little phrases in the indigenous language. But yeah, we always have interpreters. And a lot of our medical staff are actually Mexican. So we've got, you know, already they already speak the language which is very helpful but yeah everybody's exhausted from talking like the interpreters are exhausted everybody's just wiped out but it's good cool well i think i'm gonna uh, wrap up the questions there um maybe you, you might have uh, one or two pieces of uh, founder entrepreneur advice and then then we can wrap it up yeah, I guess what I would say is I had a question a few weeks ago during a podcast interview where this uh, the person that was interviewing me said, how do you measure success? Like, is it finances? Is it what, it, what, how do you measure success? And so I just said, I measure it by relationships. And I said, I look at an organization and if they have a lot of friends if they work with a lot of other people, with other organizations, with if they don't care um, what religion you are, or I'm a Christian, but I'll work with anyone, you know, like if they are open and work and play nice with others, that looks like success to me. More than like, oh, you know, all these millions of dollars or whatever, for me personally. So it's very, very important for me um, as I grow to build strong relationships and to not be afraid to work with others. So I think that's, that's fundamental for me. Awesome. Great piece of uh, advice there. Um, if I can please get a round of applause for Erica and your contribution and time. Really appreciate it. Uh, we still have some sandwiches there and the bar is open if you want to hang out for just a few more minutes. Um, look forward to meeting the folks here that I haven't uh, seen yet. So thanks again for coming by.